Here, beneath this simple grey stone monument, adorned only with the symbol of the hammer and sickle, lie the mortal remains of one of the greatest revolutionary leaders in history. Here was the man who, together with Lenin, led the Russian workers and peasants to power in the October Revolution of 1917. Here was the man who almost single-handedly organized the Russian Red Army from scratch to defeat 21 armies of foreign intervention, thus saving the young Soviet Republic from sure disaster. And above all, here in Koyakan was the man who led a ferocious and st stubborn struggle against Russian Stalinism in defense of the authentic traditions of Bolshevism, Leninism, and the October Revolution. I refer to that great man known to us as Lev Davidovich Trotsky. Leon Trotsky began his revolutionary activity when he was only 18 years of age. This was a time when the Russian working class was entering into a stormy period of strikes that anticipated the revolution. In his autobiography, Trotsky describes how he would work late into the night, writing agitational leaflets in his best handwriting, which would then be distributed to the factory workers. This work was quite successful, but soon drew the attention of the authorities. Trotsky was arrested, imprisoned, and sent to Siberia, from where he escaped and went to London, where for the first time he met with Lenin. One morning in 1902, Trotsky turned up on Lenin's doorstep in London at the time, Lenin was working on Iskra, a new Marxist newspaper around which he was attempting to unite the scattered forces of the Russian workers' movement on a revolutionary platform. The work of Iskra was enormously successful, but at the Second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party in 1903, a split occurred which subsequently hardened into the Bolshevik and Menshevik tendencies. In the beginning, the reasons for this split were not clear even to Lenin. Only after the Congress, in the course of 1904, did important political differences emerge, mainly on the attitude towards the bourgeois liberals. On this central question, Trotsky broke with the Mensheviks and remained formally outside both factions until 1917. However, Throughout all this period, on all the main political questions, Trotsky always stood closer to the Bolsheviks, as Lenin himself recognized. On the 9th of January 1905, a peaceful mass demonstration of workers led by a priest, went to present a petition to the Tsar. The demonstration was met by a hail of bullets from the forces of order. This marked the beginning of the first Russian Revolution of 1905, in which Leon Trotsky played an outstanding role. Still only 26 years of age, Trotsky was elected chairman of the St. Petersburg Soviet. 
the revolutionary organ that led the Russian masses against Tsarism. After the defeat of the 1905 revolution, Trotsky was again arrested and put on trial, together with the other leaders of the Soviet. From the prisoner's dock, Trotsky turned the trial into a defense of the revolution and a daring attack against the Tsarist regime. He was once again sentenced to imprisonment and sent to Siberia, from which, once again, he escaped. The years following the defeat of 1905 revolution were years of black reaction, with mass imprisonment of revolutionaries, hangings, shootings, and punitive expeditions in the villages to crush the revolution with savage brutality. The great Soviet film director Sergei Eisenstein famously depicts the brutal reaction of the Tsarist regime against the workers. Having escaped from Siberia, Trotsky went to Vienna, where he established a very successful workers' paper called Pravda. The paper became very popular with the workers of Russia because of its clear revolutionary message and popular style of writing. By 1911, the Russian workers had recovered from the defeat and were again moving into action. Mass strikes, protests and demonstrations became widespread. But in 1914, this new revolutionary movement was cut across by the outbreak of the First World War. Although the Second International had pledged itself in repeated congresses to oppose imperialist war, when the war was finally declared, every single party of the Second International, with the exception of the Russians and the Serbs, betrayed the cause of internationalism and supported the war credits. When Lenin received a copy of the German Social Democratic newspaper Vorwärts, announcing its support for the war, at first he did not believe it, saying that it was a forgery of the German general staff to discredit the social democracy. Trotsky had exactly the same reaction. But once Lenin realized that it was true, he did not hesitate to pronounce the death of the Second International and proclaim the need for the new Communist International. Like Lenin, Trotsky took up an international position on the question of the war. In 1915, when the small forces of proletarian internationalism regrouped in the little Swiss village of Zimmerwald, it was Trotsky who wrote the manifesto. From Paris, Trotsky published a daily newspaper, Nasza Slova, which defended internationalism and opposed the imperialist war. For this, Trotsky was expelled from France and ended up in New York, where he collaborated with Bukharin 
and other exiled revolutionaries in publishing the newspaper Novi Mir. Despite tremendous difficulties, gradually the workers began to recover from the poisonous fumes of chauvinism and nationalism. In the trenches and factories, the mood was turning rapidly against the war. From his exile in Switzerland, Lenin heard the unexpected news of the February Revolution that had overthrown the Tsar. He sent repeated telegrams to the Bolsheviks in Petrograd advocating no trust in Kerensky and the provisional government and demanding that the workers should take power into their own hands through the Soviets. But the Bolshevik leaders in Russia were unprepared for the revolution and were carried away by the pressure of bourgeois public opinion. They refused to publish Lenin's articles in Pravda and even advocated unity with the Mensheviks and support for the provisional government. On his return to Russia, Lenin had to wage a struggle against Kamenev, Stalin and others, appealing to the workers to push the Bolshevik party back onto the revolutionary road. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away in New York, Trotsky was publishing articles in Novi Mir, putting exactly the same position as Lenin. Nowadays, nobody seriously questions the leading role played by Leon Trotsky in the October Revolution of 1917. One can safely say that without the presence of two men, Lenin and Trotsky, that revolution would never have taken place. The likes of Kamenev, Zinoviev and Stalin capitulated to pressure and opposed the workers taking power. Lenin and Trotsky, by contrast, maintained a firm revolutionary line on the basis of the slogan, All Power to the Soviets. As a result of their correct policies, slogans and tactics, the Bolsheviks won over the overwhelming majority of the workers and peasants in the Soviets. This is the explanation as to why the October Revolution was practically a bloodless affair, at least in Petrograd. Even Stalin in 1918 was forced to state that all practical work in connection with the organization of the uprising was done under the immediate direction of Comrade Trotsky, the president of the Petrograd Soviet. 
it can be stated with certainty that the party is indebted primarily and principally to Comrade Trotsky for the rapid going over of the garrison to the side of the Soviet and the efficient manner in which the work of the Military Revolutionary Committee was organized. So great was the prestige enjoyed by Trotsky at that time that the Bolshevik party was universally known as the party of Lenin Trotsky. The October Revolution itself was accomplished with a minimum of violence. The real sea of blood occurred afterwards in the Civil War when the Soviet Republic was invaded by 21 armies of foreign intervention. The revolution at this moment was defenceless. The old army had disintegrated completely. And it was Trotsky who organized the Red Army, starting virtually from nothing, and led it to victory. Trotsky travelled from one end of Russia to the other in his famous armoured train that contained not only rifles and ammunition, but also a library, cinema, books and propaganda. Under Trotsky's leadership, the Red Army waged war not only with guns, but also with ideas. The Bolsheviks distributed propaganda in foreign languages to great effect among the interventionist forces with the result that there were mutinies in every single one of them, forcing the imperialists to withdraw from Russia. The Russian Revolution was saved in a critical moment when its fate was hanging in the balance, and Trotsky's role in this was absolutely crucial. Commentating on this in a conversation with the writer Maxim Gorky, Lenin at one point explains, Show me another man, he said, thumping the table, capable of organizing in one year an almost exemplary army and moreover of winning the esteem of the military specialists. The Bolsheviks took power in Russia with the perspective that their revolution would only be the first step in the socialist revolution in Europe and the rest of the world. But the betrayal of the German revolution of 1918 by the Social Democrats meant that the Russian revolution found itself isolated in conditions of frightful economic and cultural backwardness. This was what inevitably led to the bureaucratic degeneration of the revolution. A caste of privileged officials gradually elevated itself above the working class and concentrated power into its own hands. At the head of this new caste stood Joseph Stalin. Stalin had played an insignificant role in the revolution itself, but rose to a position of power in its period of ebb. After Lenin's death in 1924, a bureaucratic faction in the party crystallized around Stalin and his supporters. Trotsky attempted to defend the authentic ideas of Bolshevism and the October Revolution, but was faced with a difficult situation. The workers were tired, hungry and exhausted. The bureaucracy, on the other hand, felt itself more and more confident, elbowing the workers to one side and grabbing power in the state and the party. The opposition was defeated and Trotsky was expelled and sent into exile. Europe in general has ceased to be the center of the world. It is foolish to hope that Europe as it is will again occupy that position. Stalin miscalculated when he exiled Trotsky to Turkey, believing that he could do nothing without an apparatus. From exile, Trotsky continued his fight to preserve the genuine traditions of October. With a small band of collaborators, he organized the international left opposition. Trotsky sought in vain to find refuge in one country after another, 
but was refused. In the word of the French writer André Breton, this was the planet without a visa. Finally, he found a refuge in Mexico from where he continued his struggle, one man against the entire world. Stalin's purges were a one-sided civil war against Bolshevism. Not satisfied with the murder of the leaders of Lenin's party, Stalin took his revenge on the families of his opponents. One by one, Trotsky saw his comrades, friends and family and children fall victim to the most powerful and ruthlessly efficient murder machine in history. Yet he refused to be silenced. Stalin's trial against me is built upon false confessions extorted by modern inquisitorial methods in the interest of the ruling clique. There are no crime in history more terrible in intention and execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev in the of Petakov Radek. His trials developed not from communism, not from socialism, but from Stalinism, that is from the irresponsible despotism of the bureaucracy over the people. Trotsky spent his final years in Mexico from 1937 until his death in 1940. I met with Estevan Volkov, Trotsky's grandson, who's a long-term friend of mine. Estevan lived with Trotsky here in Coyoacan and is today the director of the Trotsky Museum in Mexico. He told me about Leon Trotsky's final years. Llegamos aquí a México en agosto de 1939, procedente de París. Llegué con el matrimonio Rosmer. Fue un cambio radical de, de, de vivir en París, en un ambiente de desolación, con la viuda de, de, de Leon Sedov, que se llama Marta, y llegar a esta familia llena de calor, llena de, 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 como era la casa aquí con el abuelo, Natalia, rodeada de puros jóvenes, fue, fue un cambio eh, radical, ¿sí? Y muy grato además, ¿no? Un país lleno de color. Y empecé a ir a la escuela también, sin hablar una palabra de español. Y lo que sí viví y, y, y comprendí y sentí fue toda esa campaña de calumnias y difamaciones que había contra el abuelo, ¿no? La prensa, la prensa stalinista de México, como era el popular futuro, el machete la voz de México, eh, cargos absurdos, ¿no? la gente de, 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 de Hitler, la gente del Mikado. Y, y luego cuando vino el pacto Stalin-Hitler, ya automáticamente el, eh, cambió la afiliación de Trotsky. <risa> ya no espiaba para Alemania, sino espiaba para el deuxième bureau de Francia o para Estados Unidos. Eh, sí, sí, no, pues fue, fue un cambio muy grato. Muy... Y yo me hice un poco adicto a la adrenalina, ¿no? Esa atmósfera aquí en la casa, movimiento, con las pistolas y guardias todo moviéndose. Y... y en el día, pues yo iba a la escuela, llevaba una doble vida, vaya. Un día de mi vida tranquila en la escuela y luego ya regresaba aquí a la casa. This is a photograph of Robert Sheldon Hart, a young American who joined the Guard here in Koyagan in April 1940. Unknown to anybody except himself, Robert Sheldon Hart was an agent of Stalin's GPU. Here for the first time, Trotsky's household was directly infiltrated by a Stalinist agent. 
Pero en enero de 1940 se observó una intensificación muy fuerte de la racha de calumnias y de los ataques de la prensa estalinista. Llegó un paroxismo ¿verdad? y fue cuando el abuelo, con la fina ironía que tenía siempre, dijo, parece que los periodistas están a punto de cambiar la pluma por la ametralladora. En las horas de la mañana del 24 de mayo de 1940, el silencio de este lugar fue desplazado por el sonido de fuego automático de la gente automática. Un grupo de armados, liderado por David Sequeiros, el pintor mexicano y stalinista agent, penetró este lugar por una puerta que había sido abierta por el agente stalinista Sheldon Hart. They stormed this part of the building where the Trotsky family lay quietly asleep in their beds, spraying it with, with bullets. You can see here in the wall, still quite visible, the mark of the impact of numerous bullets fired by the assailants. According to the calculations of the Mexican police investigation that subsequently was held, at least 300 bullets were fired, of which 73 were fired inside this building, into which the assailants penetrated through these very doors. Yo primero pensé que era alguno de los camaradas, no alguno de los guardias secretarios, ¿no? pero no. A los breves segundos empezaron las ráfagas de, de ametralladora, ¿verdad? Realmente no, no es una sensación muy grata, ¿no? Estar durmiendo en la cama y de repente que lo transporten a uno a, a la mitad de un campo de batalla. ¿no? Eh, sí, son momentos que parecen eternos, ¿verdad? Ráfagas y ráfagas, olor a pólvora flamazos y, y me tiré al, al suelo y me arrinconé ¿no? y también es decir ametrallaron la, la recámara de los abuelos desde tres ángulos desde el jardín la ventana del jardín desde el despacho y desde la puerta de mi recámara en las tres direcciones acribillaron la recámara gracias a los rápidos reflejos de natalia salvaron ambos sus vidas, ¿sí? porque Natalia a los primeros disparos empujó al abuelo fuera de, de la cama y lo empujó hacia el rincón más oscuro de la, del cuarto. Y tras de momentos que parecían eternos, ¿verdad? de repente ya volvió un silencio, un silencio sepulcral a, a la casa. ¿no? Pero en ese momento, alguien abrió la puerta, es decir, se asomó por la puerta del jardín y oí la palabra, ahí están las bombas. Entonces, el que había entrado, el, el atacante que había disparado de mi recámara, tomó los frascos. Y, pero yo en ese momento, al oír la palabra bomba, eh, salí de mi escondite y huí hacia el jardín. Sí, porque, Pensé que la casa iba a volar en mil pedazos. Y fue cuando eh, percibí un ardor en el pulgar del pie derecho, porque tenía yo una cortada profunda re al resultado de, de un impacto de bala, ¿no? En sedal. No. Y alcancé a gritar todavía, ¿no? Abuelos, como pues queriendo alertarlos, ¿no? De, del peligro que había. ¿no? Pero afortunadamente las bombas no eran eh, explosivas, eh, la casa no voló en pedazos, eran bombas incendiarias que sí ¡rum! estallaron y hicieron una gran llamarada en la casa, ¿no? en la recámara donde yo dormía. Y después, pues como decía el abuelo, 
Esa fue la tarjeta de visita de Stalin. Porque la idea de los atacantes eran que los dos grandes armarios que estaban en la recámara, en mi recámara, contenían los documentos, los archivos de Trotsky. Y solo a Stalin le podía interesar quemar y destruir esos archivos. Pues eh, después supo, ¿no? Natalia rápidamente se apresuró y con franelas, con trapos, con lo que pudo encontrar, eh, logró apagar las llamas y quemó un poco el brazo. Y, y después, eh, bueno, yo corrí hacia la biblioteca y salí por por atrás, donde estaban los cuartos de los guardias, y me metí al cuarto de Harold Robbins, y ahí, ahí estuve. Y al poco tiempo se oyó la voz del abuelo, lleno de vida, esto que... Y nos reunimos alrededor de él. Y era impresionante el grado de euforia ¿verdad? que manifestaba el abuelo de haberse salvado ese atentado, ¿no? Todavía entró una llamada telefónica en la madrugada y él pensó que eran posiblemente los mismos estalinistas que querían saber o indagar algo. Sobre la... Y pues él se puso en el teléfono y les profirió insultos y toda una andanada ahí de, de, de palabras sueces. Y todavía creo que también alcanzó a disparar sobre una silueta que corría por el río atrás de la casa. En aquel tiempo los muros eran más bajos y se alcanzaba a tener una vista de, de, del canal. ¿no? Y al poco tiempo, pues sí, nos reunimos todos y nos empezaron los comentarios y todo, en fin, de todo lo que había sucedido. Y, pero sí también nos dimos cuenta que uno de los guardias Sheldon Hart uh, había desaparecido ¿no? con los asaltantes y pues eso sí creó cierta atmósfera así de, pues de inquietud. ¿no? Finalmente sí la policía logró detener a uno de los participantes eh, del asalto y entonces ya se descubrió toda la trama. ¿no? Y fueron hasta agarrar a... Chiqueiros, que estaba allá, no sé por dónde, en la sierra de Chihuahua, por allá escondido. Pero el abuelo sabía que, que esto solo era una tregua. Que en un plazo breve vendría otro atentado. Tras del del atentado el 24 de mayo, el Socialist Worker Party, el grupo trotskista de Estados Unidos, hizo colectas y se logró comprar la casa y además se iniciaron obras de fortificación, ¿verdad? se levantaron muros, se pusieron los garitones, se, se pusieron per, planchas, es decir, persianas de, 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 fier, de hierro en las ventanas, se achicaron también las puertas, con, también con puertas blindadas. Pero el abuelo era muy escéptico sobre estos aprestos, estos preparativos. Él sabía que no se iba a repetir el mismo, el mismo atentado, que sería de otro tipo. Y la incógnita era por dónde, por dónde vendría ese atentado, ¿no? Todas las mañanas, según narra Natalia, ¿verdad? cuando despertaban y Natalia abría las persianas, eh, decía, Natacha, nos han dado un día más de vida. Y finalmente, como sabemos, ¿verdad? el 24 de mayo, un agente de la GPU, un catalán, eh, hábilmente logró pues, eh, acercarse aquí a la casa, Inicialmente enamoró una trotskista y siempre se mantuvo totalmente al margen del abuelo, que no le interesaba la política, en fin, jugó un papel muy hábil. 
On that day, the 20th of August, 1940, when this great man, this great proletarian revolutionist, sitting at this table, reading an article which allegedly had been written by this Jackson, this Ramon Mercader, to give him his real name, this Stalinist agent, standing behind this man, this defenseless man, reading an article produced from his gabardine, from his raincoat, an ice pick with the handle short, shortened and struck Trotsky in the head, treacherously, cowardly, from behind. Desde lejos, cuando yo regresaba a la escuela, noté que algo raro estaba pasando frente a la casa, ¿no? Porque normalmente las tardes eran muy tranquilas aquí en Viena 19, ¿no? No, no había ninguna actividad, ¿no? un remanso de paz. Pero en esa ocasión, ¿no? Desde, ya desde varias calles, yo vi que, que algo extraño estaba sucediendo. Había unos policías en la puerta, ¿verdad? la puerta del garage abierta de par en par, estaba un coche también eh, mal estacionado invadiendo la calle y sí, me entró una fuerte angustia, dije, algo, algo grave está pasando, yo apresuré la marcha y, y entrando a la casa luego me topé con el camarada Harold Robbins, que estaba en un grado máximo de excitación con la... Col 38 en la mano, y le pregunté, ¿qué pasa? ¿Qué pasa? Y solo me exclamó, Jackson, Jackson. Pues no, no, yo no, de momento no entendí qué, qué estaba sucediendo. Y me caminé a la biblioteca y en el recodo de ese pasillo, del jardín, sí vi un individuo en sangre, con la cara ensangrentada que sujetaban dos policías que chillaba y aullaba como, como una rata entrampada, ¿no? Y siempre he tenido esa imagen, ¿no? De, tan presente, ¿no? De lo que eran los verdugos de la GPU, al lado de los trotskistas de Borcuta, ¿verdad? Que morían bajo las balas, ¿verdad? Cantando la Internacional y proclamando vivas a Trotsky y a Lenin, ¿no? Y esos mismos eran los que los asesinaban, ¿no? En esos campos de concentración, sí. Esos eran los héroes y stalinistas. Pues proseguí mi marcha y entré a la biblioteca y por la puerta entreabierta vi al abuelo en el suelo, ¿verdad? la cabeza ensangrentada, Natalia aplicándole hielo y, y había dos camaradas, creo que era, si no mal recuerdo, Johansen y... Y quién más, y Charlie Cornell, estaban también al lado. Luego me, comentó, me contaron ¿verdad? que el abuelo, al oír mis pasos, eh, señaló hacia la puerta con dificultad: eh, tengan, un, alejen al niño, tengan al niño alejado, así va alejado, no debe de ver esta escena. Con anterioridad también, según narraban los camaradas, cuando oyó los quejidos del, del asesino que estaba todavía en el despacho y movilizado por uno de los guardias, también indicó, no, no lo maten, debe hablar. Y pues sí, Trotsky cayó en, en, en las trincheras de la revolución socialista. Trotsky no era hombre a morir de vejez en la cama. Y, pues él mismo en ocasión comentó ¿verdad? que cuando un hombre ha cumplido su misión en la vida, la muerte no es ningún problema. Y considero que Trotsky pues, ha cumplido su misión ¿verdad? con creces. ¿no? Y, y sí, nos ha dejado pues, un gigantesco arsenal marxista ¿verdad? que enriquece pues, sí, todo el acervo que existe para que los explotados ¿verdad? del planeta puedan luchar por un mundo mejor, ¿verdad? donde se radica, erradique esa explotación tan despiadada, extrema, en que está actualmente la humanidad. ¿sí? Today, 100 years after the October Revolution, 
and 25 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the enemies of socialism tried to maintain that the Russian Revolution achieved nothing, that it was all a disaster, which it would have been better to avoid. This is entirely false. The October Revolution overthrew a monstrously oppressive and corrupt regime, opening the way to tremendous material and cultural progress. The Russian Revolution demonstrated, not in the language of dialectics or the three volumes of Marx's Capital, but in the language of steel, cement, electricity and space rockets, that it is possible to run the economy of a gigantic subcontinent without private capitalists, landlords and bankers, and to obtain the most remarkable results. History has never seen such a colossal transformation as the one that changed a formerly backward, illiterate, semi-feudal country, such as Tsarist Russia was in 1917, into a powerful industrial economy with an educated population and a huge number of doctors, teachers, scientists and engineers that were the envy of the world. It is true that under incredibly difficult material conditions, the Russian Revolution eventually succumbed to bureaucratic degeneration that ultimately led to its destruction. Trotsky pointed out that a planned economy needs democracy as the human body requires oxygen. Only under a system of democratic workers' control and management can a socialist planned economy succeed. But the crimes of Stalinism cannot eradicate the fact that the USSR demonstrated to the entire world the enormous potential of a socialist planned economy. At a time when the capitalist economy is in crisis everywhere, when the collapse of 2008 finally exposed the bankruptcy of the so-called free market economy, it is time to revive the idea of a planned economy as the only way to carry humanity out of the present crisis and raise it to a qualitatively higher level. In the year 2017, the ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and above all that great revolutionary and martyr of the working class, Leon Trotsky, are a powerful source of inspiration to the new generation and a shining beacon for the future of humankind. Thank you.